in the name of the living and loving God, who is creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. This letter to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, is a fascinating document. It's really one that could be um, looked at and prayed over a lot. And I want to focus on that. Equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Equip the saints. You know, you folks are saints. All of us are saints when we are faithful in our lives. That's what the author is saying. Equip the saints for the ministry things we do because of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, for building up the body of Christ, that is the church, until all of us come to the unity of the faith. It's a lot of meat in this, in this letter. But its placement in our liturgy and our worship today is even, more, is, is even more interesting because we continue the story of David, this amazing complicated character in um, Hebrew scriptures. And of course what we heard today was, uh, was after having been a, an effective and strong leader of the people of, of Israel, the Hebrews, through lots of battles and moving towards Jerusalem and, and all of this. After being an amazing, artistic, faithful leader, uh, we see the other side, the downside, the underside of, of David, because he was a murderer. He was an adulterer. And in that last line, after Nathan pulled him into this story and hooked him, he said, Nathan said to David, you are that man. You are that man that did this bad thing. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Okay, this strong leader, David, I have sinned against the Lord. So here we have a statement of deep humility and repentance and awareness of the sin that, he's, that he has committed and really asking for forgiveness. And that amazing psalm follows right on the heels of what David said to Nathan. It's a great statement of, you know, sort of clearing the decks. Yes, this is what David did and what he said. And we do the same thing, right? We have confession every single Eucharist. But on the other side of this letter to the Ephesians was uh, the, the gospel reading, you know. If the, the joke is, if it's August, we talk about, or in July, we talk about the bread of life. I mean, you know, they've been talking a lot about bread. This is following the feeding of the 5,000. But, but there it is. There it is. Those, those followers of Jesus said, um, how do we get this, you know, how do we get this life, this bread of life, this, this way, this nourishment that lasts forever? And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. A promise, a promise that through our faith in the risen Christ, we won't go hungry and we won't go thirsty. And so there's the Eucharist table, the Eucharistic table. On the one side is the confession, let's get it straight. On the other side is a reminder that we will in fact be empowered by the risen Christ to do the ministry of Christ, to work for unity. I think it's fascinating. And right there in the middle, is this Ephesians. So let's talk about that, the letter to the church in Ephesus. It probably was not written by Paul. Uh, there are lots of theories about that, but probably was not written by Paul because for one thing, it's not addressed to a specific community. And that's what usually Paul did in his letters. He said, to the church in Corinth. And, I mean, in the actual letter, it's not addressed to the people and to the issues in that faith community. I mean, the Corinthians were behaving poorly, and he addressed that issue in the letter to the Corinthians. But this was sort of a generic letter about faith communities. So the idea is that it was probably a circular letter that was written by a follower, a disciple of Paul later in the first century, and was sent to lots of congregations, and maybe the copy of that that went to Ephesus had at the top to the Ephesians. Anyway, the point is, this letter has been sent to us. That's the beautiful thing about hearing scripture read in worship. 
this letter has been sent to us today about our faith community. So don't get too sensitive about it, but, <coughs> but listen to it <coughs> because it's strong. And it's also liturgical, as I just said. And you can hear sort of phrases if you read the whole, go through the letter of Ephesians. It sounds, it's more poetic and it sounds rhythmic. Um, it's, a, it's a strong letter. So first of all, and Paul is really good about this. Paul said some things about women and some things about slaves which we don't, with which we don't agree. That's all cultural. And let's just put that all aside. He also talks a lot about encouraging those faith communities to be faithful, as he did in this letter, and you heard it. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, the Christ, from whom in the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament, with which it is equipped as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. There was a lot of conflict in the first century with Christians. Remember, there were Jewish Christians and Hellenistic Christians. A lot of controversy, a lot of false Christs, a lot of false prophets. And so he's speaking to that. I mean, there were some times rather seductive. Don't be fooled by that which is not true. And that certainly, it's not that all of us are lost, but that certainly is a challenge for us in this very day. There are a lot of things pulling us away from that true pathway with which Jesus walked. And it's good for us to be reminded, don't be tricked, don't be tricked by things that are pulling us away more deeply into the secular world, which is not of God. I mean, that part of it, which is not of God but stay true and stay faithful. He also in this thing talks about the, the, the diversity of spirits, and we can certainly see this in this congregation. Where there, there's so many ministries that, I mean, there's the ministry of music, there's a ministry of softball, there's a, min, there's a ministry of cafe, there's a ministry of teaching the, the, the children, there's a ministry of the school, there's just so many ministries that you folks are participating in. And, and not everybody's doing everything, but everybody's doing something because of who you are, your personality, and the gifts that God has given you. That's a wonderful thing. Celebrate the diversity of the gifts that exist in this faith community. And at the same time, work for a unity. A work for a unity that it keeps coming back again and again to the love of Christ. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. And I'm sure you heard earlier the language, as I say, this is sort of a liturgical thing. The language that was talked about, one, one faith, you know, one Christ. The language of our baptismal liturgy and those early baptismal liturgies comes from, a lot of it comes from Ephesians, just like growing into the full stature of Christ. That was, that's in our baptismal liturgy. The church. You see what I'm saying? This is a letter to us, to the church universal, and to this perish. So we're going to do something about it. August is a great time to sort of make plans for September, beginning of the program year. And so the clergy and the adult formation ministry team and the parish community ministry team, we want to focus on two things beginning September the 9th. We're calling it a homecoming Sunday. And listen, have any of you been to churches that had homecoming Sundays? Raise your hand if you have. I can't believe it. Y'all haven't been, yeah, well, there are a few of us. I mean, this is Virginia. This is the South. Homecoming Sunday, that's a big deal. Coming home from all your vacations and getting started. We're going to call September the 9th Homecoming Sunday. And here are two programmatic 
foci that, we want to, that, that we're going to introduce on that Sunday. One is, one, one, is a, one is something that really could be called intentional formation. We've seen a lot of our presiding bishop lately and hold him in your prayers as he has undergone surgery and uh, recovery. He, is, um, he has made a mark in the Christian world through his preaching, um, through his person, who he, the person whom he is, who he is. Um, and so the Episcopal Church a couple of months ago developed sort of a, sort of a simple uh, curriculum called the way of love, something the bishop talks about a lot. And so we're gonna, we're gonna focus on that sort of, and it's a fantastic structure because it, you don't have to read a book, one thing, you don't have to read a book. <laughs> Just reflect on your life, and it addresses classic Christian practices like how do you pray? How do you worship? How do you offer acts of compassion? It's sort of like a way to take stock of where, where are we as individuals and as a church in our faith journey based on these ancient practices that faithful Christians have observed. The other thing, the other thing, the other focus is going to be something called invitational evangelism. I mean, you heard in here that some, that is a gift, evangelism. Some people are called to be evangelists. And um, another way to look at that is that we don't, you know, we Episcopalians don't like to, you know, say that we are evangelists or something. It's too much. We want to be more polite and a whole lot more softer about the whole thing about telling our story or even inviting people. But, what we want to do this fall is really to prepare, just as it says, to equip the saints of St. James Episcopal Church to invite people in, an, in a way which is authentic to come worship with us. And uh, we're going to have preparation sessions, so, and I'm going to prove to every one of you that you can do it. The thing, the, thing that we, the thing that we're worried about when we talk about evangelism is what if we fail, you know? What if we invite somebody and they don't want to come? Or what if we don't really know what to say because we're not, we're not comfortable with our own faith's journey? And yet Ephesians is saying, be faithful to your, fa to your foundation so that you can share your faith and invite others into a relationship with Jesus Christ in a way that is not trying to convince, but simply invite. And we see that those two things, really being comfortable as inviting people to come and reminding us of the basics of our faith are important for this parish at this time. In this, in this line, it says um, that we're to build up the church. But you know what? It doesn't say one thing about numbers. It's talking about building up the church in the quality of our faith. So the whole focus of September, I know we'll have the pledge campaign and all that. But the whole focus on evangelism is not to get more people in the pews so that we'll have more money in the budget. That's always a good thing. But that's not what we're talking about. We really are talking about coming into a faith community so that others, as well as we, can go deeper into that faith in Jesus Christ. So what I'm doing today is sort of saying, stay tuned. There'll be a whole lot more about this. And we hope that it will be an enriching time for this parish, just as it was for the people in Ephesus in the first century, and for the other churches in that part of Asia, as they were inspired by Paul and the followers of Paul to be faithful, to be loving, to expect forgiveness, and to turn to the risen Christ to be empowered and nurtured for the rest of your lives.